Welcome to Money in the Air, the music podcast about neighboring rights, the royalties you earn from the public performance of your recordings and the business of music in general. Brought to you by IFR, the International Association for Artists and Rights Holders. I'm Andrew, a royalty consultant helping artists to collect on their value. Hi, I'm Gina Deacon. I work for Absolute Rights Management and I work with record labels and artists to ensure we claim the royalty income due to them. I'm Stacey Haber and I'm from Inside Baseball Music Publishing. Hi. Hi, I'm Tanya Oliveira. I work for Transparency Entertainment Group. I focus on World X USA neighboring rights on the performer side and rights holder side. Hello, and welcome back to Money in the Air, the neighboring rights podcast brought to you by IFR, the International Association for Artists and Rights Holders. And today, our very special guest is Rasha Shaheen from Water Bear, the College of Music. Hi, Rasha. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, no, it's such a pleasure. I've been waiting for this one. For those of you who don't know, Rasha is the principal of the college. She's going to talk to us about what gets taught both in the bachelor's program and in the master's program with respect to neighboring rights and then the different courses and how they interlap with neighboring rights. Rasha, tell us more about yourself because your CV is so dense, both as a performer and as an educator, that I'm not really sure how to pare it down. I mean, I think it all started when I grew up in Saudi Arabia. So I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Music was taught one day and all of a sudden it was banned. It was the, you know, the call of the devil. And I was obsessed with music. And when I was 16, I found out that I could like learn how to play music. So all I wanted to do was figure out how to express myself through creativity. And I wanted to make sure that I could learn everything about the industry so that no one could stop me doing it. So I wanted to do the DIY route. So I did everything. I learned, you know, I did, I tour managed, I curated festivals. Yes, I was in bands. I studied music technology, did a master's in songwriting and then did a master's in performance science. But all of that was just to kind of make sure I had this DIY information. When I was younger, I was anti-labels and I'm sure it was to do with Saudi Arabia. Money was evil. So labels, I've changed my mind about that now, but that's kind of what drove me and what motivated me. When you were studying yourself, anybody mentioned neighboring rights? Very good question. And actually, no, like I learned about PRS and I learned about MCPS, mechanical rights. But, you know, it was ages later that I got introduced to PPL and still didn't really know what, what that was. And that, that is it, isn't it? Neighboring rights is PPL for the UK. Is that correct? That's right. And, and I know you teach about it on both courses, both degree levels. And is that because you didn't know about it and you just want to keep telling everyone like we do, shouting it from the hills? I mean, I love how you've coined money in the air. That's really, really brilliant. It is an, an important kind of thing to get used to. In the beginning, you don't, you might not get royalties so much, but you kind of, you're training yourself. And, and maybe I should explain how the courses are, both, both you know, for the BA and the MA. It's, it's, you know, it's, they're very kind of like individualistic kind of bespoke courses where we get to really find out what each you know musician or artist or you know professional wants from from their career and it's only in the first term where we kind of go through the kind of like the we, we give them the toolkit of of the music industry in one week we cover royalties and so we do we do introduce the concepts there but then it's gonna it's down to them once they know about it it's down to them to kind of find out more and kind of utilize it you know so so that that happens in the ba oh you know it's interesting isn't it it only just happens one one week in the program but we do you know like we've invited you to do talks and so how it gets brought up again is like through through conversations within master classes artists guest artists who come and they talk about how they're you know how they make money and and they you know they talk about the importance of royalties there so it's kind of like then brought in via case studies if that makes sense it does it makes perfect sense and it also comes up in the mentoring process i every student of yours that i mentor in, in at least one of the tutorials, I take them through yeah. the royalties and who they have to register with. And just to add to that, and that, that's their choice, isn't it? Because you don't you don't mentor all the students. It's those who are interested in kind of either sync, you know, that they then come, they yeah. choose you to kind of like get more information from it that way. That's right. Absolutely yeah. right. But when I put it out there, even in a masterclass about neighboring rights, everyone knows. They've heard of PPL. Yeah. They know they have to do something administrative. And, yeah. and that's such a step above 
other schools where I've taught. So we love you. <laughs> well, that's really good to know. Really good to know. That's interesting, isn't it? It's I mean, more comprehensive and it's more an understanding of the business of music, which is great. Yeah, yes. And it, that, is, that is what we do. We kind of like make sure that everyone knows how to have a sustainable career within the music industry. Why do you think people don't talk about it? I'm, that, that's interesting that like to find that out. Because it's never been well publicized here until we started banging on about it and saying, not only does this exist and no one knows, there are problems. So we need to tell everybody and we need to fix those problems. And it's not just the UK, it's around the globe. We were really surprised. Not only did people not know that they had to register with PPL, they didn't know they had to register the recording first as the rights holder. Otherwise, they'd never get paid as the performer. And yes. then we found out that people didn't know if they didn't have a label, they were the rights holder themselves. They were their own label. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know the difference between the P in the circle and the C in the circle. They might have studied music and their concert level performer, but nobody ever taught them the business or the different rights and revenue streams, the mm -hmm. admin. So many young artists that come to us as individual professionals in the industry think that once they have perfected their music and learned about mastering, that's it. Yeah. The work is done. They don't realize the work yeah. just begins because exactly. all the registrations have to happen and then the marketing and then everything yeah. else. So that's, you know, we're trying to educate everyone who's not coming to your school or any school who just are making music and thinking, that's all yeah. there is to it. How much do you think they miss out on then? Like the average artist or they don't sign up for, you know, PBL, w roughly. What do you think they could be missing out on? It varies wildly from country to country and from song to song or artist to artist. So they could be missing out on hundred pounds a year or hundred thousand pounds a year or a million pounds a year. For instance, if you were a session player on a song that gets played to death that Christmas, like Mariah Carey, maybe, and you haven't registered, you're probably missing out on 50 grand a year. Wow. Yeah, I would agree, Stacey. If you're a session player on just one hit, anything by Adele that's been released as a single that's been a hit, that's about 50 grand a year, and that's sterling. So it's crazy money, and people don't know about it, so that's why we keep talking about it and just promote it and encourage musicians to sign up. We had one guitar player come and talk to us who said that he had always registered PPL thousands of recordings he registered them all on PPL but he didn't do a, a proper job he thought once he registered one title it would collect for every compilation it was on every film it was used in and that's not the case so when he got a representative to take over the admin of his neighboring rights he added a zero to his income and that's one of the problems with the neighboring rights revenue stream the admin is very complex and you have to do it properly. Even a student who says, oh, that's interesting. I want to learn more about that. Won't know about all the pitfalls and the complexities and the extras that they could do to add to their income. So it's worth, it's worth the whole semester on different rights. Once you've put the work in, then yeah. you can put on it. I was talking to somebody today who didn't know about PPL, didn't know he owns his own recordings, didn't know about registering them, didn't know about claiming them exactly as Stacey just mentioned. In fact, Stacey, he took your strap line from last week. He said, I didn't know because I didn't know. And I said, oh my goodness, that we, we've just been using that. Basically, he is going to go out now and ensure that he claims everything, but he needs to go back. He could have about 200 recordings that he needs to work on. But once he's got that in place and once he's got those sorted and registered, then it's a case of a little bit of admin each year and just updating it as and when you either perform on anybody else's recordings or release your own. It's just a little bit of back work at the beginning to and worthwhile. But yeah, he knew all about PRS, all about PRS, nothing about PPL. And we hear that day in and day out. Because PRS, they've kind of they've 
they i mean i don't I, I haven't seen it now for a little while but they have stickers everywhere don't they they like you go to all the venues and you see the prs but i'm not sure if you do see the ppl and um, you do know it since 2018 they've, they've got a joint venture so it was a joint license so each premises like a hairdresser a gym a bar a music venue will pay just one entity so one off payment instead of paying two different two different companies for two different licenses because it confused a lot of businesses especially new ones indie ones it's like it looks different now the sticker they have on their windows you know like how they're talking about music and, and nfts you know the whole crypto embedded kind of have you have you had a conversation about that and how that kind of could help music and royalties and and what are your thoughts on that yes in fact we're putting together a webinar about nfts and the rights that aren't being looked at when nfts and music are being sold so for instance the publishing right is being neglected the mechanical royalty specifically, does a rights owner of an NFT have a performance right in it? And if they did, do they know how to register it? Because they certainly don't become rights holders or performers, but if they become the venue, if you will, if they're performing it in public. NFTs are great. It's a new type of revenue stream for creators. It can be very lucrative and it can be a whole new industry in itself. Yeah. But it is in its infancy stage, so there are still teething problems about all the rights that should be involved in art. And I guess I meant something else. Then I think I'm talking about like the whole concept of blockchaining, where like music, kind of like it can, that the whole identity, like you know, P PPL, PRS royalties, and and can be embedded into the song that like you don't have to then chase it. And you know how you you know you, you, one of the issues that you had that that we've got that you're saying is that. The administration is so tedious and so is is there a way do you think that in the future with the technology of blockchain and that whole cryptocurrency that all the all the information could be embedded into a song and then it just you know wherever the song is played it just it, gets logged for the musician yes i think it's possible i think the difficulty for it will be determining what is a public performance but definitely the coding can include the metadata for the rights holders and the participating parties yeah it won't yet but it can do is it an issue that's arising at your school that you're going to have to incorporate it's, curriculum it's not an issue i mean but it, but the issue the issue is that the conversation isn't being had and it's a new thing but it's just kind of just it's this idea of like how to how to make it easier for everyone to collect what's theirs there have been conversations for years about a black box for public venues so that the songs the actual data is recorded about what recordings and what compositions get played so that people can get paid according to real statistics, not just algorithms and averages. And that's been decades. So I don't know how quickly they're going to achieve it for digital, for NFTs, but I'm hoping it's a lot quicker. I have a question for you because you have a lot of international students. Yeah, we have, we do have international students. Yeah. I want to know how you talk to them about who they should register with because I have definite opinions on that. And I want to know if we're in sync. The international students currently that, that we have, I mean, and I think particularly with the MA, they are based in their hometown. So I would recommend to them that they find the equivalent of PPL. What are your thoughts on that? I agree with you. Everybody should register with their local if their country is a signatory to the Rome Treaty. Some countries aren't like the United States and Australia and South Africa. And I think if they're not, they should have representatives that will help them register in countries that will help them earn a country. What do you guys think? What do, what do you advise your clients as reps? If you have a significant yeah. amount of consumption in a certain territory, go direct in that country. Otherwise, move forward with the mandate with Sound Exchange or go through Canada is what I usually say. Tanya, what about you? Yeah, yeah, very similar vein of thought. Figure out where your largest audiences are, where you get the most airplay. And then I, I like to recommend joining several societies, big ones around the world, like Act you know, as an example in Canada and, and then the US one, a few European ones, especially if you're American, because a lot of European countries do pay you. So it's figuring out which ones do pay you, but that's a lot of work. So if you get yourself a representative or an agent, they know the, the tricks of the trade and they know the intricacies and they can really help you and maximize your income we work with quite a lot of american artists and we would literally select the best societies for them and the ones that would work a lot of it depends on where they recorded their music as well so we'll look into all that 
But yeah, we often find that a lot of American artists come to us and then we will select the correct territories for them. I love it when you guys all agree. Brilliant, thank you. How come American artists want to work with you then in the UK and they're asking you about the royalties? Because I work for a company that works with a lot of labels throughout the world. So we speak with their artists to ensure that they're covered for their royalties. And it just so happens a lot of those artists are international artists. Most Americans are unaware of neighbouring rights because, to be fair, it's not the law in the US. You know, you can get digital income from satellite radio and there's other streams. And then there's some reciprocal deals with certain European territories, as we previously mentioned, but they're just unaware. So that's why you'll find almost every American session musician is registered with PL, at least regionally. So just for UK collection. And they can do all that online, remotely, send the forms, all good. But... A lot of them, like Gina and Andrew were saying, you want to join up with a rep. And to be fair, I think most representatives are in the UK. There's quite a few springing up in the Netherlands. Between us, we just, you know, we're signing up so many American session musicians, which is which is great. And they they all tell their friends, of course, and they haven't been touring for two years. So they're just like, how can we make money? How can we get extra money? And it's so nice when they get like a surprise check and they're like, wow. And it's like, it's your yeah. money, it was yours, it's due to you. Concerned about the fact that there's more recordings being released on a yearly basis because of the whole DIY market, but the amount of recordings that are actually being claimed at Sound Exchange, which is, again, just for the satellite radio component of this all, has gone down. So the number of recordings has gone up, but the claims have gone down. So there is still an issue with education and awareness for Sound Exchange as itself, let alone neighboring rights in the States. What have you found that works to help people? So yes, they sign and you mentioned like some of the pitfalls are basically just, is it just the tediousness or is it, or is it the kind of like overwhelmingness of just not knowing? I really believe it's an education thing and it's hard for people's brains to get their heads around the fact that if they're releasing through a distributor and they're receiving a payment, why should I be worried about other payments that are coming through? And for some reason, they all know the performance aspect on the publishing side, like ASCAP and BMI, and PRS, but everything else, they don't necessarily know that. And the MLC has been trying to do a very good job. I mean, they have been doing a really good job about the marketing and getting people signed up. But I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and he's putting out his first single, and he's like, Okay, I said, well, where are all your registrations? And I asked him, who are you signed up with? So he listed three out of the four, but he was missing the MLC. I was like, let's get you signed up with the MLC. You have your ASCAP, you have your DistroKid, and you have your down exchange, but MLC is also important here for your publishing income. I sat with a new artist yesterday um, to register his PRS and his PPL for his first single. And even sitting with me doing the PPL registration, there was a glitch. And if he was on his own, it was about dates, the recording date versus the release date, the repertoire date. And if he was on his own, he'd have stopped and he'd have walked away. But I told him, just submit it anyway. And even though there's red and there's big sign saying, this is wrong, this is wrong. I said, it's not wrong. I even called Naomi and said, I'm doing this and I know it's right. And she said, yeah, it's right, just go. So it happens. The problems happen even to us, but we have the confidence to get past it. And of course the registration had a green tick, which means it was valid immediately. But yeah. if he was on his own, he'd have just walked away because it's very intimidating and it's glitchy. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a really good point. And also, so you might own some masters, but not from the first date that the truck was recorded and released. You might start owning the masters five years later, you know. So then when you put in the rights ownership start date, sometimes it throws you out because it wants to do 1st of January of the year that it was originally released. And you're like, yes, I know that, but I now have rights five years after that. It takes a few goes to be like, oh, okay. And it's this is and it's correct. And yes, as Stacey is saying, we have the confidence and and duration, track durations are so important, but they're not mandatory, but they should be mandatory because a lot of sister societies around the world push back if you use PPL for the world because there's no duration and you'll never get paid. And it's like, why why aren't we told this? It's just little things we know. And even so people who even know that they have to register, artists or rights holders get frustrated when it doesn't work and they've spent hours doing the registrations. And I think, well, it was never going to get paid a lot anyway. So, and that's not true. You can get paid a lot. 
that's the thing about neighboring rights. You earn the money, whether you register it or not. The question is, are you going to do the work to collect the money? It's, it's such a baffling conversation, to be honest, because artists, they desperately need the money. So it, it feels to me like that, and this is this may be some of the work that you're doing, is that like the whole process of registering needs to be made easier, you know, somehow, just like some kind of user-friendly kind of experience. From your experience, what is the one bit of advice? What's the main... I know that the main bit of advice is do it, right? But like, what's the other bit of advice that will help them when they when they release their first single? What what do they what do they, what do they need to have prepared? What, you know, you mentioned the things that they don't need. That's not mandatory, and that is mandatory. Is there kind of like a couple of bullet points for like you know have this 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 and that's all you need and go for it? Andrew, maybe what do you think? I would say have an agreement of what are all the splits in the song, who are the contributors. So have that in writing, have a signed agreement by all parties. And that's your kind of your baseline. And then from there, make sure that you're collecting on your label, your your just your streaming sales on the master side, and then on also for your neighboring rights. And then flip side, be aware that there's a composition element as well. So your PRS. And then MCPS, so your mechanicals, if you're self-published. Is that how it works in the UK? You Can you sign up directly with MCPS? Does it function can, similarly to the MLC? Yeah, yeah, you can join okay. directly. It's quite a big fee, but some people, they prefer to do that rather than a publisher doing it for them. Or I would call your local society and just go pick their brains apart because they probably will share some really vital information to you as an up-and-coming artist if you're releasing your, your stuff. You pointed something out that actually is another kind of issue that I think, you know, that we've noticed is the whole conversation of band agreements and, and how many bands actually talk about the splits that they're actually going to get. And, and it's only later when they kind of have the discussion after everything's done that that kind of creates a lot of the, the arguments. But, you, you know, you're spot on. That's, that's really important. And also a list of who played what, who made an yeah. audible contribution. If you do it all before you leave the studio, there's no fighting afterwards. So one of the things that the societies require is evidence that you played on it if you're claiming as a performer and the rights holder didn't list you, which yeah. they don't because they're sometimes lazy. If you don't have that agreement, then it's harder to get the evidence after the fact. Start with an Excel document. That's what I always say. Create an Excel document and list down, not only released yourself, but any other artist work that you've performed on. Because in my experience, most artist performers are creators and they don't want to do the admin side. They really don't. So it'll get put off and put off and put off. If you keep this record, create an Excel document, list down the title, the artist, and what your contribution is, then when you're ready to sit down and do your claiming, if you don't have a representative that can help you with this, and you do it yourself then you've got this document to hand and you can it will make it a lot easier it will yeah. speed up the process massively if you do have a representative then trust me that representative is going to be so grateful to see that excel document from you as well rather than have to uh, try and sit down and work it with you so that's my piece yeah. of advice that's right if you're not doing the business end and earning the money from it then it's just a hobby it takes a little while for musicians to kind of be comfortable with the conversation of money and I yes. think that is ultimately the other, the other issue, you know, the conversation of like, generally mu musicians want to believe that they're doing it for, for the art. You know, you mentioned it's not, and, and, and that prevents them from kind of like the conversation of money kind of dilutes the creativity and the experience in a little way. And, and I don't know if you've had that experience. I'm actually very curious to know if you have had that experience when you're, when you're talking with, with, with your artists. But that's why you do it at the end of the session before you leave the studio. Instead of, you can have an agreement before you walk in, like Lennon and McCartney, everything will be 50-50 no matter who really writes it. I would recommend just bring in the blank sheet and then fill it out and everybody signs it before you leave the studio. Thanks so much for having me here. This is a really you know, interesting conversation. Oh no, thank you. You're brilliant. It was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you guys for listening. Remember, go to IFAR, IAFAR.co.uk. Send us your questions. Remember to become a member so you have access to all of our materials and all of these podcasts. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.